Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here this evening um, for our brand new series, Fighting the Good Fight. Amen. Fighting the Good Fight. As you can see, we've got the slides on the wall for you this evening. I won't. I, I know it's not appropriate to turn your back on a congregation, but I'm going to have to do that often tonight because of technical difficulties. I apologize. Um, the screen in the back is, uh, I don't know, for some reason it seems like it's not compatible with my computer. Um, so um, just bear with me as I, as I fumble my way through these slides. <clears throat> if it sounds like I have a sore throat, I do. I have been <laughs> battling um, that, sinuses and bronchitis. I found out yesterday that I have bronchitis. Um, it came on all of a sudden, um, and uh, it feels like it's going away even faster. So <laughs> we'll see. Um, I can breathe today. I couldn't breathe yesterday very well at all. So uh, thank you to all of you who've been praying. Um, I have uh, also seen a doctor and got some medicine. I've uh, kind of had no choice on that, but thank you for your prayers. And uh, continue praying for me, please, because... <clears throat> I don't know how, uh, really, I don't know how I'm going, my body's going to react to try to teach this evening, but with God's help, we'll make it. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> As I said, we are beginning a new study this evening, and I, well, before I do that, let me say hello to everyone on Facebook or on YouTube, whichever the case may be. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening and joining us with our study. Uh, we hope that you receive what we have received from this. Um, we hope that you're as blessed as we are, and we hope it changes your life. And I believe that if we meditate on the Word of God, allow the Word of God to do what it does, and that is change us, but we have to allow it, uh, then we will be changed forever, and we'll be changed for the better for it. The Word of God has never done anybody wrong. It has never led anyone astray. We can take it literally. We can take it uh, for exactly what it says. It is correct. We don't have to guess. We don't have to uh, dive off into theories. Theories are nice, and sometimes, you know, uh, we have to theorize on certain things. However, what we do know of the Word of God and what it says precisely is good enough for, uh, for anything that we could ever face in this life. Um, uh, oftentimes, people can theorize too much, and uh, whether it be eschatology or whether it be um, pre-adamant civilization, whether it be uh, just whatever, name the topic. There are any you can even theorize about salvation should you uh, dive off into the deep. Um, but what I want to tell you is the Word of God can be taken simply, and th the simpler, the better. It seems. And it seems that the simpler you, that we give it, the, the, the more impact that it has on our lives. Can I get an amen from the congregation? So thank you for joining us online. And uh, you are welcome uh, to be here with us also. So should you get the opportunity to join us in these studies and contribute to our discussion, I feel certain you will add to us here and not just us add to you. So Thank you for joining us, and you're welcome to do that. And we love you. If there's something we can do for you, reach out at any time. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Uh, this series, Fighting the Good Fight. Um, I want to begin this series, and I hope that you have your Bibles with you this evening. If you do, go ahead and uh, prime your fingers, because I would love for you guys to help me save my voice <laughs> by reading for me. Uh, of course, not everything, um, not everything uh, uh, I, will I ask you to read, but you should have a list in front of you of the scriptures, and it's okay to look at the next one and flip on over there while I talk about the one we're on. So, uh, but don't let it distract you, um, uh, but you're welcome to do that if you can do it without being distracted by it. Amen. So, um, to begin. Uh, we will begin this series in prayer. Father God, I love you. I thank you for this awesome opportunity to teach your holy word. God, your word 
is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. And truly, it's never done us any harm. And it's never done us any wrong. God, it is full of blessings. It is full of wisdom. No one can ever point to your holy word and say that it, it has done them harm. It is so good. And God, tonight, that is all that I wish to convey is your word to these people so that they might receive good from it. And that's the truth, the good truth, the gospel truth. God, the, the reality of our situation, this uh, earthly yet heavenly yet supernatural uh, warfare that we are fought, that we are fighting in, that fights against us, God, the more aware of it we are, the better off that we are. So, God, I pray that tonight something is said that changes someone's life today, God, in such a way that it adds to their being, in a way, Lord, that can then be shared with others. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I'd like to begin this by reading from 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 14. Um, I, I ha have, have uh, adopted the New King James Version, and it's okay if you're following along in a separate translation. But at 6 and 11 through 14, the Word of God reads like this. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to you which were also called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you may keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing amen and amen to the reading of God's precious word so obviously this lesson tonight in this series under or fighting the good fight is called uh, <clears throat> understanding our fight um, we will move of course you may have lots to contribute to this uh, we will move through this study one chapter at a time per month um, the next month, the brother Jerry Vestal will be uh, will be teaching uh, Jesus. It'll be specifically about our Lord and how Jesus is a model for our warfare. Chapter three will be put on your armor. Of course, we'll be spending a lot of time in Ephesians chapter six during that time. Chapter three, uh, uh, chapter four, take the offensive. We may, uh, we've, we've already spoken to the youth group about this. Um, we haven't settled on it yet, but it feels like it's headed this way. We may include the youth in on this, on that particular chapter for three Wednesday nights so that they can hear because uh, we had discussed that if there's one thing that our youth lack in this day and age, it's take the offensive. So that's just a few months away. Then the following study will be our enemy within. The next one is the power of intercession. Number seven will be intercession is for the church, talking about how we intercede and why. Um, chapter eight, understanding strongholds. Well, that's something that sounds like a lot of us need to know, isn't it? Um, number eight or number nine will be breaking those strongholds down, which, again, is it's not just about understanding, but it's about our actions, and that's what I'm going to drill down on tonight in a very basic way, uh, that is our actions. Number 10, surviving spiritual abortion. I bet you've never heard that one taught. Um, chapter 11, submission and authority in warfare. Number 12, why spiritual gifts? It's just asking a question, a question and of course, we'll answer, answer that question. Why spiritual gifts? And finally, chapter 13, will be spiritual gifts as weapons of war. Tonight, it's not my intention to preach. It's my intention to teach. Now, should the Lord uh, come upon me to, to, um, 
to preach, of course I would, uh, but it's my intention to teach. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, that is the point of a, of, a, uh, of a class, and this is not a lecture. Um, I would encourage you to just simply raise your hand. If I notice it, I will call upon you. If you have anything to contribute, also raise your hand. Now, we just read out of Timothy. I want to take a hard left for just a moment, and I want to ask you a question about, uh, about a, a, a physiological or a neurological function of the body, uh, the, the human body, and that is the concept of fight or flight. Have any of you heard of that before? Of course you have. Most everybody has. You hear about that in high school or junior high even. Fight or flight. Harvard University um, tells us about it here. I, I found this on their website. The autonomic nervous system has two components, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system functions like a gas pedal in a car. It triggers the fight, flight, fight or flight response, providing the body with a burst of energy so that it can respond to perceive danger. Now, I would like to, now perhaps when you're talking about the, the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system and blah, blah, blah and all that, perhaps they are correct. Perhaps those are your two options. Um, but I would submit to you in practicality to this evening that there's a third one. There is fight, flight, and submit. If you'll know, if you there, that, there have been dogs in my life. I love dogs. Well, I don't. Uh, uh, I, I cherish them. I think they're great. I grew up with dogs. But you know, if you're playing around, especially as a kid, I would play around with dogs, and I would just lunge at them. And, you know, if you did that to the wrong dog, it would be mad at you. You know, it might bite you. Some of them will. Um, some of them will turn and scoot and run away. Now, my little dog at home, she's a little, well, she's a little nuts. Um, she, she's normally, she's got the biggest mouth of the littlest dogs. And she'll bark and yip and yap and she'll carry on. But once you know her, if you lunge at her like that, like you're going to try to play with her or scare her real quickly without her thinking it's playtime or something like that, she will submit. She'll lay, she'll instantly, her ears will go back, she'll lay down on the floor, she'll roll over and show you her belly and pee all over the floor. <laughs> I'm right about it. That's what she'll do. That's submission. That's what that is. It's an admirable quality in a dog. Um not so much for a Christian. Not so much for a Christian. Now, there is fight, there is flight, and there is submission. Um, I want to ask you a question this evening. Are you a fighter? Are you a fighter? Should we, as Christians, even be fighters? People say, well, Christians are all about passivity. Christians are about this and about that and it's peace, love, and harmony, and unity with the world and all this stuff. And we're not supposed to judge and carry on and carry on. That's the, that's the topic today. It's how people say it. It's how it acts. But if you know anything about me, you know that I believe in taking the entire Word of God as one continual context. That's just the way it's supposed to be, like it or not. Let me just say this. I've said it before in sermons. I think it's been a while. The Word of God is replete, that means it's filled, with scriptures that describe our plight in this life as Christians. Now, it also describes the plight of the sinner, those who flee, flee and those who submit, or perhaps those that, heaven forbid, fight against Christ. It describes their plight as well, but our role in our life is distinctly defined. There is no room for submission. There is no room for running away. In the army of the Lord, there is no category for deserter, except that 
the deserter, is found in an, in an apo apostate state. What does that mean? I didn't say apostle. I said apostate. 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 Apostasy is when someone voluntarily leaves the Lord. That is flight. That's running away. I submit to you this evening that it is just as bad when in the face of danger and trouble or in a, a spiritual attack of the enemy to submit to the enemy. I submit to you this evening it can be worse, especially for those around us as an example, for those of us claiming to be an example of Christ to the lost and dying world and in our own homes and amongst our own kin. Submission is a dangerous example. It's a dangerous example. So then, I would like to highlight... Um, the fact that we are supposed to fight. If you'll notice in the scripture that we just read in 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 14, if you'll notice in that scripture, he says, fight the good fight. <laughs> what kind of fight is that? Fight the good fight. He tells us, doesn't he? Of faith, lay hold of eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. You'll find that in verse 12. Fight the good fight. Notice with me that faith, which is the type of people that we're supposed to be, right? Yes. Faith requires a good fight. A good fight. Not a bad fight. It does require a good fight. Uh, and, and I hope that through this learning, that we will begin to open your eyes as to what a good fight is. Faith requires a good fight. We also, since this is the fight, fight topic, we do have an enemy. I'm going to go through them quickly because we're going to cover them later. Enemy number one is the world. We find example of that in 1 John 12, or 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Uh, enemy number two is the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 talk to us about the flesh. Enemy number three, can anybody guess? The devil. <laughs> Satan, Lucifer, um, that and his dark kingdom, those who uh, are aligned with him. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, we'll read that there. But... <clears throat> I would like to take a moment before we actually get into understanding our fight. I would like to take a moment and highlight whom our enemy is not. Who our enemy is not. Um, Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. So, who the enemy is not, it is not flesh and blood. That's what the Word of God tells us here. Can flesh be an enemy? Yes. Flesh can be an enemy. But flesh is not what we wrestle against. More often than not, we find ourselves as Christians wrestling against flesh and blood. Um, take, for example, a married couple. Can I go there? Is that all right? A married couple. Uh, my wife and I, at times, we have disagreements like, like you. Um, but in reality, as Christians, we have something to consider first. We have something that we're supposed to consider. Our fight is not with one another. It's the enemy who's the accuser of the brethren, okay? So whatever disagreement there is between us, I can tell you that God's not in it, that there is a place in which harmony is offered by God to us on the issue, whatever that issue may be. But as surely as I start seeing her as my enemy, I have forgotten forgotten that I'm in a war 
and not with her. I'm engaging in a war with the flesh in that moment. I have told you from this pulpit, from with this microphone <laughs> in times past, and I will do it again and again and again because I, it is a message that needs to resonate and reverberate through this the, the, the day and age in which we live, and that is this. Whatever you're facing, whether it be sickness, whether it be discord, whether it, whether it be a, a financial circumstance, whether it be a, a problem, name the problem. As a Christian, it is our duty, and I, I come back up by the word, it is our duty to first assume that the problem that we're facing, facing is a spiritual attack in design. First, that is our first assumption always. Of course, it's not our last, but it is our first. It's our duty to assume that whatever it is that we're walking through is a spiritual uh, attack or has the potential to be a spiritual attack. If Christians throughout our land would consider this fact, if, if Christians would make this assumption first, I believe <laughs> I believe a whole lot of our problems would um, quickly become settled. I really do believe that. If Christians would say, okay, what does God say about this first? Okay, what could the spiritual ramifications of the decision that I'm about to make or the mouth I'm about to run? Come on now. What are the spiritual ramifications of the story I'm about to tell? What are, what are they? Then I, I wager you to say that the church would be a whole lot stronger, that families would be a whole lot more close, that businesses would be a whole lot more pure, and governments would be a whole lot less corrupt. Come on, somebody. Think about it. If Christians would just act like Christians in a war, would just act like every opportunity that we, that, that we come up on to make a mistake or to make a decision even is an opportunity for God to get the praise and the devil to be defeated, where would we be? What would we be doing? Come on now. This is the God we serve. We serve the God who loves us, is looking out for us, and wants us to know and act like disciples, to have discipline. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. One of the things, the first things that they ever did with us in the military was they disciplined us. They made us get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They made us go to bed at 9 o'clock at night. They, they made us do with laser precision everything that we were told because they were, they were changing the, our stinking thinking so that we were no longer a civilian on the street and into a, into a, a, a finely tuned, mentally sharp, focused uh, a person who understood that they were about to go fight a war, and that's what I'm trying to do with you this evening. I'm trying to cut off the fat or shave off the hair or however you want to say it and re redirect our footsteps down a different path so that we understand what it is that we're doing here. It may be, it, it may be random thoughts that come into our head. It may be... It, it, it may be uh, 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 depression, anxiety, mental illness. All these things are things I've dealt with myself, so I'm preaching to me. It, may, it could be anything, but if we'll first make the assumption, first, I'm not saying last, I'm saying first, make the assumption that it's a spiritual event, attack or no, event, spiritual, please, thank you.
and we don't even realize that our spirit is being affected by the flesh because the enemy uses flesh as a vehicle to fight us. He uses our flesh and he uses other people's flesh. Amen. As much as he can. Yes. Yes, he does. The flesh is a very powerful uh, he, we're going to get into that in a minute. But, uh, no, you're fine. That's great. Uh, we're going to get into the three influences in, in spiritual warfare, and we've discussed them. I've, I've presented them to you already, but we're going to break them down. The enemy, the flesh, and the world, and how they relate and affect one another. So we're going to get that in just a few minutes, but that's that's so good. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um Understanding our fight. I would like to introduce this to you this evening by going really to the very far end from here of history. Uh, notice I said history, not future. History. Uh, we find a, a reference. John, would you, would you be so kind as to join with me in Isaiah 14, 12, and then down to 15? Uh, John's going to read Isaiah 14. 12, all the way down to 15 for me, and I think we'll begin to see, paint a picture of the beginning so that we might understand the, the nature of spiritual warfare. Brother John. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What, 15? Yes. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Amen. Here we have an account of the enemy, Lucifer later called Satan. We have an account of him actually being cast out, fallen from heaven, all the way down, cut down to the ground. And uh, it, is, it is, of course, we know Christ's own uh, uh, recounting of that when he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. I recently heard a, a preacher who, who was talking about the fall of the enemy the fall of the devil, and referenced that verse and, and referenced the speed of lightning. Um, he said Satan did not fall simply by gravity. Gravity would cause you to fall, I think, what, 50 feet per second or something like that, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, lightning, on the other hand, is many, many tens of thousands of feet per second. So when the enemy fell out of heaven. He fell out with God's force behind it. He fell like lightning out of heaven. He did so, of course we know, by uh, God's uh, judgment on him. And because of pride, pride was found in him. Uh, he, he became indignant. He said of himself he would ascend to the very throne of God and be like him. And that was the indication that there was pride there, and of course that, um, uh, of course that, is the first tool in which he appealed to men, um, and caused man to fall with as well. Um, understanding the nature of spiritual warfare, I would have you to know, this evening it is an intense war. Is the nature of this war? Intense. That's the question I want to pose to you this uh, today. And while you think about your answer, is this is the nature of this war intense? I would read to you the opening salvo or the opening exchange of shots between uh, the the forces of heaven and the forces of darkness, and that is found in in Genesis three fifteen. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So then, there we find uh, the, the opening 
shots between the forces of evil and the forces of God, righteousness and holiness. God specifically uses a word here, enmity. That means the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. Notice with me, God is the one who put enmity between our enemy and us. God put enmity between our enemy and us. A feeling or state of being actively opposed and hostile toward some. Well, then how come, Brother Dave? <laughs> how come, Brother Dave? Don't we all feel that way all the time about the devil? Why is it? May I suggest to you that there is occasion in which the enemy is perceived as an angel of light. <laughs> there is an occasion. There are occasions in which the enemy does not always come to us like a snake or a serpent. Come on now. There are occasions in which the enemy uh, uh, comes to us as, as, as something appealing, something desirable. Uh, ask a drug addict the first time they got high, what was it like? It was the greatest feeling on the earth. Ask the fornicator the first time they ever done any of that. They say it's the biggest thrill you ever experienced. Ask the drunkard the same thing. Ask the thief the same thing. Oh, why did the thief? I've countless times you hear of thieves that recounting a story. I, I saw a th I saw a thing uh, where a thief had stolen a, a a surprise package, like a like a prank package, that was specifically put for a thief to steal so that they could record their reactions. It was good stuff, and you could hear the the mother who was the th the thief talking to her, I don't know, maybe 12 to 13-year-old boy as they're opening the package. And uh, the, 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 the son is talking to the mother about how exciting it was to have stolen this off of someone's porch. I'm getting a thrill. That, that, that's the, the, the way of it. That's the way of every sin. I, I, the, the swindler swindles the money because it, he's, he's getting a thrill because of the self-gratification he's going to experience in his own bank account. Am I right? Politicians corrupt. Corrupt. Don't care which side you align with. They're both wrong. They're both liars. They're both corrupt. Period. The reason why they are is because of themselves. They get a thrill from the power or the money or the, the authority or whatever it is, it's, it's, it's the angel of light scenario. So then that ought to explain why the enmity does not co constantly exist. Anybody else? That answers our question then, doesn't it? If God put enmity between us and our enemy, the reason why enmity is not always uh, felt or noticed between us and evil acts is because the evil acts are dressed up and purtified, if I may say it like up a holler somewhere. All right? Purtified. Um, allow me to say what God said, though, in a different way. Is that okay? Depends on how I say it, right? Allow me to say this a different way, the Genesis 3.15 idea. As God speaks to the devil, every time they see you and recognize what you are, they will be opposed to you. Can I say it that way? Of course, that's paraphrasing. That's my own way. But every time they see you and recognize what you are, they will be opposed to you. I came by to put you against him this evening. I come by to remind you that the wages of sin are death. 
And there, that's what it means to be on the enemy's side, partaking his pleasures, regardless of, of, of it being the hardest drug or the juiciest tidbit of gossip. The wages are the wages, and they pay up. We, pl- we, we store up. The Word of God tells us we store up wrath against ourselves. We're getting paid. We just ain't drew it out the bank yet. We're storing it up. That, and and um, all because we can't recognize how we can't we can't recognize how rotten the transaction is. We can't recognize that it's the enemy, the flesh, the world, or the devil that's behind it. Um, so I came by to expose that for you this evening. Imagine if everyone would recognize him for what he is. Everyone. Imagine. Imagine if we could see the end of the illicit affair. Imagine. Imagine if we could see the end of the robbing of the bank. Imagine if we could see the end of the death of, of, uh, uh, of committed by murder, committing murder and death. Imagine if we could see the end of the death uh, that, we, that we allow to f- flame out of our mouth. Imagine if we could see the devil for what he really was. It, it, it probably put us preachers out of job within a few years. I believe the whole world could be evangelized in 10 flat years. I really do. Up every holler in every country in America, across every ocean, I believe 10 years, if if Christians could just recognize, I think that's one part of it. There's more. But one part of it is just recognizing the evil that's around us first. He that is opposed, he recognizes you. Make no mistake about that. The enemy does recognize you as an enemy. He recon- he recognize he has enmity with you. Uh, Pastor Deborah shared a thing on Facebook the other day in response to the sermon that I preached called the uh, on the parable of the sower and the seed. It was extreme, but it was dead on and it was accurate. It was it was it held no punches whatsoever. It described. Just one portion of that sermon, and that is the part in which the hard-packed wayside has the birds of the air to come and steal the seed. That's all that story was about. Of course, there's other types of ground. But it goes on to tell us about how the enemy comes to church every Sunday and steals the Word of God out of people's hearts. And he's perched, ready and waiting, and he never misses church. And it's true. The enemy, I say he. But notice with me now, I could also say that the enemy is our flesh, not just the devil, but the enemy is also the world, those three. Now, it could be the literal devil, but there's, there's flesh and the world as well, provoked by the enemy and affected by the enemy and vice versa probably. But the point remains, constantly ready to steal the precious seed I stood up here, and I'd pinch a little bit, and I'd throw it. And I'd pinch a little bit, and I'd throw it. And I'd pinch a little bit, and I'd throw it. Spiritually, what's happening is the enemy is stealing the majority of it. Stealing it. Still just running off with it before it ever even gets a chance because it's falling on hard ground. It's not, it's not, it's, the ground's not receptive for the for the hardened heart that is if that's not you you're good ground glory to god be good ground be the better ground every day but the point is the enemy never stops his work i am careful here the enemy never takes a day off the enemy never takes a vacation the enemy continues the, uh, the assault for as long as we're wrapped in the body of this death, as Paul called it. We're going to have to fight this fight, wage this warfare. That's just the way it's going to be. We're going to we're gonna have to do it. 
the intensity in which the onslaught happens, it happens to me every single morning when I wake up. I'm not so holy that I don't fight the good fight. I haven't yet laid hold of eternal life. Come on now. Have any of you? We will one day. But it is not this day. So then, the enemy's onslaught will continue and continue and continue and continue. More often than not, we are surprised. And yet, we ought not be. Should we know his word, we know the fight is coming. The, the fight has been, is now, and will be until we go by way of the grave or are called home by the Lord. The fight is every day. The intensity is very high, very thick, very heavy, however you want to say it. Maximum power. It is an onslaught. Should we respond the appropriate way? There's a concept in the military Meeting force with force. Meeting a force against you with, a, with more force or an appropriate amount of force, whatever that may be. Oftentimes, it's overwhelming force. It'll never happen if we don't actually live like we're in a war. It'll never happen. We'll never f- meet force with force if we, don't, if we don't live our lives like we're in a war. Why do I tithe? Why do I tithe? I tithe because I know I'm in a war. It's not just because his word directs. It's because I know that I'm going to need provision from the Lord. I know I'm going to continually need his help. Of course I want to obey. Of course. Of course. That's number one. But also because I know that I. it's just part of my discipline. It's just part of the ingrained in the soldier, the, the fighting the good fight of faith. Why do we pray? It's because it's part of the discipline. It's because we live like we're actually in a war. Why do we read our word and have it daily in front of our faces? It's because of discipline. It's because we're soldiers. We live in life like we're actually in a war. Why do we worship? We worship because it's discipline. Of course, there are lots of other reasons, but it's what Christians do. Why does a soldier march in formation? Because it's what they do. <laughs> why do why do we worship God? We worship God because we're Christians. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our makeup. It's part of our discipline. Routinely, though, Christians are found not with the same intensity level as the enemy, intensity and discipline. The war is intense whether we act like it or not. Now, I've been in war, real war, and I know what complacency looks like. Complacency creeps into every every single uh, form of employment or life. Every person is susceptible to it. Christians are no exception. Christians typically do not engage the enemy with the same level of intensity in which he engages them. If the enemy is trying to steal your sleep, how about you turn around and give all of your sleep to God? If the enemy is turning, is attacking your family, give them to God. If the enemy is attacking your finances, give it to God. If the enemy is attacking your health, give it to God. We should be doing this already, but we routinely just say, well, it's okay, I can, you know, God don't care. God's got the cattle on a thousand hills. What does he need? What does he need with my this or that? You know, what? God don't understand. I've worshipped the Lord for, for weeks on end, and, and I've gone to every church service and this and that. God will understand with the same intensity. Is that the same intensity that God uh, or that the enemy has toward you, that you would have toward God? I would ask because I don't believe it's, uh, I, I don't believe it's routine. It's when we increase our intensity in worshiping the Lord and in our spiritual disciplines such as worship, prayer, and the Word, etc. 
but those three namely, prayer, worship, and the word. It's when we increase our discipline. Discipline's always been a part of discipleship. It's when we increase our discipline for, uh, uh, in this war is when we will begin to see spiritual results from it. Uh, that is the po- first point, intense war. The world. Uh, would someone read 1 John two fifteen through 17 for me? Jerry, please. Please. I like that. <laughs> We're just there. And and you're right about if we turn up our intensity, the enemy turns up his. That's true. But that's no reason to submit. And right, right. He will. Uh, uh, Pastor Deborah and I one time fasted. And when we did, absolutely all and, and I'm not using this as a as a derogatory way, but literally all hell came against us. It was so terrible, so vicious. It was crazy, but it only lasted a week. Am I right about it, honey? It only lasted a week because we kept the fast. We kept praying. We kept reading. We kept working for the Lord. We kept going. We didn't quit. We didn't give up. And I'm not saying you'll be through your trial in a week. And I'm not saying the enemy will turn his attack off in one flat week for you. It may be quicker. I'm, I'm getting so inspired by Jerry. I'm so glad. Come on, it's Thank fine. you, Jerry. Um, Great. Just kind of thought of the encouraging stuff that we've been talking about in our foundations class. Y'all are teaching their foundations this week. Kind of um, so about going from a place of wilderness into where God wants us to be. And when we start gaining ground, we must fight to gain ground. And so when we want to start walking in the promises of God and walking into that place of calling and destiny, it is not going to come without a fight. That's a, another part of why God, the word says many are called, but few are chosen. There are people walking in calling, but as so, or, or not walking in calling, but who are called. But as soon as they step out to do something, the devil fights them so hard, they retreat instead of push forward. And so I believe that if we can grasp this, then it will, it's not going to make the fight easier, but the way that we deal with it is going to make it worth it. Because we're going to see there comes a point on certain things that we gain victory and we gain ground. It's not always that we're slipping backward and he's just beating us and beating us. We have victory through Jesus Christ. So when the devil does come at us and we actually recognize that we're in this, if that should spur us along to get to go on into the calling that God has for us. I hope that makes sense. It does. But I mean that, like he said, that can be with our tithing. If God, when God reveals that to us, that's something that has just been in me for I don't even know how long. My mom taught me that. I know the I know the word of God. But even as long as I've been doing it, every now and then we'll get a financial, I don't know what, out of nowhere. And why is it my money worked last week, but it's not working this week? And the devil's like, well, if you wouldn't have paid all that to the church, you would have had it. And I'm going, no, if I hadn't have given it to God, I wouldn't even be sitting here. Come on. So I have to give him the word back because he's never going to relent if he thinks he can get a hold somewhere. But when we've got victory, then we've got our history <coughs> with the Lord, and that gives us forward <laughs> progress. Amen. Amen.
Anybody else? We're talking about the nature of spiritual warfare here. Please, John. Understanding. To understand, you first have to have a, a, a mechanism to awaken you. Right. There you go. <laughs> so all this stuff, the, I mean, the, the first word, understanding, is perception. So at my old age, I have to wear these reading glasses to perceive what's written <laughs> on the written page. So I need a tool. So this this class we're having is a tool to bring forth the word of God to awaken or our, to bring our perception to how the word looks at our battle as a Christian. Uh, I think about one battle that uh, I had as a parent. My daughter played with a girl uh, that was next door. Very convenient relationship they had. But we put her on restrictions. She was not allowed to play with that girl. Well, the mother of the girl found out, and she was hysterical. But anyway, the little girl had a, had a problem of always lying and causing trouble. That's the simplicity of the matter. But you think of your little girl or your little son playing with a, another cute little girl or cute little boy and all the innocence of the flesh that we think but once we have that perception of the influence of anything other than God is evil. Mm -hmm. Is evil. Not that the little girl was evil, but she had these influences that I could see was spilling onto my daughter. Now let me say, my daughter. Come on. And so as a parent, we are to, to train up a child, but we're to protect our children. Right. And so this, this is very important. So you go to each one of these things in intense war. If we can open up to the unseen realm of a spiritual battle that we are in, our perception will never go back. to. And, and if we can change that, our understanding, so all this is perfect. But the idea is to open our perception and once we do that, we'll start to understand all these five things that you're talking about tonight. Well, I don't think I'm going to get to all five, John, but thank you for the vote of confidence there. <laughs> uh, because there's like four more slides. <laughs> um, so, no, I won't get through this. But um, you're dead on. That really is what I would love for... You can't understand the fight if you're not going to acknowledge there is one. So we'll, let's just call that what this is. This lesson is acknowledging the fight first. Does okay? Let's take okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Without now, we're not naming names. We're not talking about people. But can you think of somebody in your life who, who just will not acknowledge that, that they're in a spiritual war, a spiritual attack, and they're about to be destroyed? Keep that in your head. Just keep it in your head. Just keep it in your head. How valuable would it be to them if they would just come off of it and say, hey, you know what? Maybe this is spiritual. How, how about it? How about it, people? They're going to see it. From somewhere, there, we can, I believe that we can change, like John was talking about. We can change their perception. I don't know how. I, just, I believe completely that it's going to be unique to every individual. Every individual has a different shade of rose-colored glasses upon which they see. Come on now. Everybody has a different set of spectacles on their face. I don't. Side joke. Truth is the truth, though. Therein lies the issue, really. We have got to first acknowledge it for our own lives. Come on, folks. We're in a spiritual war. The enemy seeks to whom he may devour. He, in the book of Job, the, the, uh, the devil presented himself with the rest of the sons of God, which... I would have gotten to tonight at some point if I'd have just read through it. <laughs> but um, the enemy, the enemy presented himself to to the to the Lord, and 
Lord asked him flat out, where have you been? What have you been doing? I've been running around, going here and there, little everywhere. The Word of God tells us that, that we, know, we know what he's doing. He's seeking whom he may devour. Come on. If we will start actually living like we're in a warfare, I believe that we can see people saved who absolutely have been given up on. Right? Given up on. Because there's plenty of people out there that the world and Christians have said, ain't no way. I've got one right now. It's in my mind. I may get the opportunity to speak to this person, a family member. I may get the, uh, an intimate encounter with this person, one-on-one, -on -one, where I might get the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat it like it's a war. But I'm not going to attack him. Come on now. I'm not, that's part of the realization. That's part of the understanding. That's part of the unveiling. You look at somebody, you're not looking at your adversary unless you're looking with spiritual eyes. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to see when you look with spiritual eyes. You're going to see a victim. You're going to see a victim. A victim of what? A victim of the enemy. A victim of the enemy, the same as you, the same as me. We are all born into sin. We're all born with the same problem, every one of us. We're all born with the same deformity and the same disability. We're all born with the same thing. So I, I think that goes back to, to, the, to the judgment. forth the, the word, you still show forth the love of God in, in, in doing that. Um, yes. When you said an intense war, there's an intense war. We have to understand it and know that the enemy is ribbed up because his time is short. He's seeking whom he may devour. And when I say intense, the, the spiritual war can come to the mind, come in the spirit, and war with you in the spirit. You un Before you go anywhere, it will come directly to you to shut you down and, and put that fear in you, okay, so that you won't go forward or so that you will, you will back down. 
but you can't back down because you have the word of God. True. And 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 you you might for a moment when you get attacked because he's so subtle and so quick that you may not at that moment recognize where this is coming from, but you will. It will it will resonate. The Holy Spirit will bring it to you. So the war the warfare is is greater than any warfare you will ever encounter. And we have to be we have to be bold. We have to be strong in the Lord. We have to give the enemy the word of God. We don't back down. You know, you can encounter somebody that that like she said, a family member and, and what they have to say. And I agree with what you say also, Deborah. You know, you can go in prayer and, and, and all of that. But sometimes that that enemy won't allow you to to speak at that time. Okay? So God may have somebody else that he's going to bring along. And then when you go back, or if you go, when you see them again, you will, see, you will know because they'll tell you that, they, that so-and-so gave them the word of God. So it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy journey because the enemy is on our trail and he's not going to let up. And he's always, always ready for a fight. And we have to, the word says to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But in prayer and supplication, in praying and giving things to God, in praying and believing and trusting God, that this that I'm going through, because I've been through some, some horrific, horrific, intensive warfare, that I hope and pray that none of you ever go through it. Yes, same here. Yes, same I'm here. Right. I've been through some pretty intense things, um, whether it be physical, Amen. spiritual, in the soul. Yes. Uh, I have experienced a lot of different types of attack. Now, let me tell you something. Staying at home and keeping your head low does not do anything. It doesn't do a thing. It doesn't protect you. It doesn't help you. It's of no benefit whatsoever. As a matter of fact, coming to the house of God, joining with the people of God, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but something what? Exhorting one another. That's what the Word says. So then, I find strength in the house of God with the people of God and the concentration of the Holy Spirit where there's pe people uh, yoked one with another, of course the Word of God tells us that where there are two or three gathered in His name, He's in the midst. There's other scriptures too we can all quote. We've all heard many times before. So then, why would we just simply go duck into a closet? That's not fighting. That's fleeing or submission. It's definitely not fighting. The only way we win is to fight the good fight of faith. I, I, have, um, I have developed a saying, and that is, I'm, I'm still developing it, <laughs> but that is, um, I would rather have a confrontation against a bad spirit than to pacify it and become beholden to it. I mean, that's just because I'm learning, too. I'm learning, too, the nature, the very nature of the war that we're fighting. I, 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 and that's what happens to us. If we don't confront it, we become beholden to it. That's just the way it works. If we don't fix it, if we don't fix it spiritually or, uh, or make an avenue in which God can fix it, let's say it the right way. Submit ourselves to him so he can fix it. When I don't pray for God to fix my wife. I pray for God to fix me first, regardless of whatever my flesh perceives. That's, first, that's step one. Okay, God, where am I going wrong here? Fix me first. But I would rather confront something. I would rather confront something with, a, with like you were talking about, Sister Brenda, with a good heart righteous attitude, according to the word, having prayed up, 
having worshipped God and been in his presence, felt the touch of the Holy Ghost, I'd rather confront than just pacify, 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 and then become beholden. It's always better God's way. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life was the ex- the exhortation from Paul to Timothy. It's 10 after 8. I wish I could have uh, got further along, but that's okay. I hope you'll leave here this evening with this thought in your mind. God, give me spiritual eyes that I might see what you have me to see. Have that thought on your mind. Have that prayer on your lips. Be open to that change in your life. Believe me when I tell you, it never stops just because it happens one time or just because you leave here and say, well, I'm pretty enlightened. Well, tomorrow you're going to need it again, more of it. Then the day after you're going to need it again and more of it. And the day after you're going to need some more and again and again, and it's going to go every single day you need to get up. Say, God, give me the ability to see not what I'm being confronted with in the flesh, whether it be a wife, a husband, a boss at work, a sister, a brother, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, a nephew, a niece, uh, whomever. Say, God, give me the vision to see what's actually happened happening in the spirit and not what everybody else thinks because obviously alcohol's bad obviously dope's bad obviously the illicit affairs bad we can shake our finger and, and and spout all the same old rhetoric all the time the same stuff we can just say it all the time, all the time, all the time, but until we see what's really, that's all flesh. Until we can see what's really going on, until we can see, until we start seeing with God's eyes and see the spiritual, see the ravens stealing the seed. Say, well, I've told them and I've told them and I've told them, but you haven't considered what kind of ground you're throwing the seed on. That's for somebody. Maybe it's online. Consider. See with different eyes. And here's the one place you need to see with the, with the clearest spiritual vision. And it ain't with your aunt or your uncle or your cousin, your nieces or nephews or your spouse. It's when you look in the mirror. Let us pray. Father God, we love and appreciate you. We thank you for your word. I pray our eyes be open to actually seeing what's going on around us. It's not hyper-spiritual. It's just the reality of things. And, Lord, it is it is uh, what you want us to hear because your word just pours forth spiritual warfare. It just pours it forth. So then, if it's that important to you to... to to sprinkle it everywhere in your word from, from Genesis to Revelations, to, or to Revelation, if, if it's that replete in your word, it, it, it ought to be that important to us. So help us, oh God, take a good hard look at what we are, who we are in you, in our disciplines, Christian disciplines, namely prayer, worship, and the word. God, but give us the spiritual eyes to see what's going on around us and to look at those we love or those in our orbit, maybe a complete stranger at the gas station, to look at them with different eyes. Help us, God. we got to have your help. We're going to need reminded of it, and we're going to need a new veil taken down off of our eyes every single day. Would you do that for us, Lord, as we submit ourselves to the warfare, as we endeavor to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life, would you help us to see what's actually going on around us and to acknowledge this intense warfare in which we fight? 
Father, I thank you for rebuking complacency and that we actually get started, that we actually get going on this warfare that you've called us to fight as good soldiers of the cross. Thank you for it. God, I pray a special blessing over every person here. Love on them as they go. Keep them safe from all harm. Bring us back to the next appointed time for Youth Sunday on Sunday morning. Glory to God and amen and amen.